would encourage all of you to download and print out the Blueberry IPM guide. That is going to be your most reliable resource for pest management recommendations. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about insecticides today. That's because those change often on an annual or more frequent basis. And the most up-to-date pesticide information is always going to be in that Blueberry IPM guide. At NC State, we maintain a number of extension portals. So we have an entomology portal shown there at the website and then a blueberry information portal. And you can find additional information from my program relative to insect management and blueberries at those two locations. I also wanna point out that a number of other folks have contributed information to this presentation and Ash Sile at Georgia, Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State, Dara Stockton and Greg Loeb at Cornell, Lauren Diepenbrock, who's at Florida, and then Laura Kraft, who's a grad student in my lab, have all contributed information that I'll be sharing with you today. So first, I'm going to give you an overview of the key arthropod pest in blueberries. We'll talk a little bit about spotted wing drosophila because that has become a significant management issue in blueberries. And then I'll highlight a couple of emerging pest issues. This is a timeline illustrating the key blueberry pests in southeastern blueberry production. And again, because where I work in North Carolina, my focus is largely on southeastern blueberry pests. I know a couple of you guys are from perhaps a slightly outside that region. Um, so I do have some information filled in from other colleagues, but for the most part, we're talking about southeastern critters. And so along here, we have um, on the bottom, the time, the phenology of the crop. So everything from dormant all the way through post-harvest. And then overlaying that, we have the different pest organisms. And the icon next to that pest organism indicates the plant part that it attacks. So if there's a little blueberry cluster next to that name, it means they feed on fruit or flowers. If there's a little stick next to it, it means they feed on stems or branches. And if there's a leaf, it means they feed on leaves. Unsurprisingly, the insects that we tend to get the most questions about in blueberries are the fruit feeding insects. And those fruit feeders that we tend to get most questions about are spotted wing drosophila, which we'll talk about in more detail later, blueberry maggot, and cranberry and cherry fruit worms. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on those pests than on some of these other ones. So starting off with blueberry stem borer, this is a longhorn beetle, which feeds on a number of different related species and can cause tunneling in blueberry canes. Those canes will eventually die when that tunneling occurs. And so what, that's what the damage looks like. This is what the adult beetle looks like. And for this blueberry stem borer damage, your most efficient management tactic is going to be good post-harvest pruning. And so removing any canes which are damaged, getting them out of your field and destroying them. So this is a cultural control strategy for this pest organism. Moving later into the growing season, so blueberry bud mite um, can cause damage to developing buds. And so shown here in the inset, you can see buds that are malformed and kind of blistered from blueberry bud mite damage. That again happens early in the growing season when those buds are prior to opening. Um, in general, in North Carolina, we handle blueberry bud mite damage through post-harvest pruning. And so these are some images from Bill showing mechanical topping of blueberry plants post-harvest and the degree to which those are cut back. Um, the way that this works is the blueberry bud mites are on the more distant parts of the branches post-harvest. And then when we remove that part of the plant, we've removed those, in, those mites before they can migrate back to lower parts of the branches and bud scales where they're going to overwinter. So this breaks their life cycle before they're able to migrate back to where they're going to spend the winter. And then the new flush is going to be free of those mites and you don't have an overwintering population. This works well in locations where you have time following the post-harvest pruning for those plants to grow again and set new fruit buds. It's less effective when you have a shorter growing season. Moving on to blueberry gall midge. This is more of a problem in Florida and South Georgia. And so this is not something we typically deal with in North Carolina to any great extent. Um, but this is what those little larvae can look like. They're fly larvae, which feed on buds and can cause gall formation resulting in bud abortion. The way that you determine whether or not you have gall midge present, um, because it can be kind, the damage appearance can be kind of cryptic, these buds can look dried out and almost frost damaged. And so distinguishing between blueberry gall midge damage and frost injury can be difficult. 
So if you take those buds, you place them in a clear plastic bag, you put it in a sunny, warm spot. If there are blueberry gall midge larvae present, they will crawl out of those buds. And they are shown here in this enlargement from my colleague, Ash Sial in Georgia. So in Florida and Georgia, they damage flower buds, which results in potential yield reduction. In parts north of where I work, like Michigan, they damage vegetative growth. So they damage foliar buds. So this is another slide from Ash, again, showing that females lay eggs in flower and vegetative buds um, as those bud scales separate. The floral, dam floral bud damage is more of a concern from a yield loss standpoint. And again, in South Georgia and Florida, this becomes a management issue and can result in significant bud loss. And because the damage occurs at a time of year when frost injury is likely and it can appear similar to frost damage, it can often be conflated with damage due to cold injury. Um, so again, there's the bag-based sampling method where you can collect flower buds a couple times a week and monitor them for larval emergence. Um, and Ash also has some information on using bucket traps to monitor for adults and information on specific pesticide-based controls is going to be available in the Southern Region Small Fruit Consortium IPM guide. Ash has done some efficacy work on Movento, which is a newer insecticide. And again, the rate information will be available in the IPM guide. This shows the label recommendations for blueberry gall midge management. And there's also the possibility that this active ingredient may have some activity against things like scales, blueberry mealybug, and possibly bud mites. So there's ongoing research to try to determine the efficacy of this material for a suite of difficult to control blueberry pests. Um, the tricky thing about this label though, when you consider it for possible use against gall midge or bud mites, is that it cannot be ap applied until after petal fall for pollinator concerns because it's a material that has some pollinator health constraints. And so right now, although the material might have some efficacy, we are constrained based on pollinator protection considerations. Moving on, let's talk about flower thrips. So flower thrips are another organism that can damage blueberries during the early part of the growing season. And in this case, we're most concerned about floral damage immediately prior to and just after those flowers open. This is more significant again in Florida and South Georgia than it's going to be in other parts of the southeastern U.S. Most of the thrips that you're going to find in blueberries feeding in flowers are going to be eastern flower thrips or western flower thrips. They look very similar to each other and they behave very similar to each other. Um, and the concern here is if you have large populations of thrips present, which can occur during the southern highbush season in Georgia, you can, you can have some floral damage that results in floral abortion and reduction in potential yield. So similar to monitoring for blueberry gall midge, to monitor for flower thrips, you would collect clusters two to three times per week, place those clustered in sealed bags in a sunny hot location, and let the flower thrips exit those um, those flowers and then count them within the bag. The other thing that I often do is I take a small glass vial full of rubbing alcohol. I drop my flower clusters into that vial. I shake it up and the thrips fall out of the flower clusters that way. And you can count them on the bottom of the vial. That's somewhat faster, um, but a little more labor intensive than just waiting for them to come out in a bag. So if you have fewer than two thrips per bloom, which again, and so this, keep this in mind, when you're taking a cluster of flowers, you're taking you know, anywhere from five to 10 flowers, placing them in a bag. And so if you have five thrips come out of a cluster of five flowers, that, that is less than two per bloom, is a non-economically significant number. If you're moving at more than two per bloom and higher, that's when we start to become concerned about those numbers and when management might be justified. We wanna be very cautious about making a pesticide application to control thrips and blueberries because those applications are made at the tail end of the bloom period when pollinators are going to be present. So you really wanna balance out the risk to pollinators with the potential risk from thrips and not be too aggressive in making a management decision there. 
Um, another group of thrips that's an emerging pest concern are chili thrips. So these are foliar feeding thrips. They're an invasive species found in Florida and Georgia right now. And you can see some damage in the lower left-hand corner of this slide on the foliage caused by chili thrips. And that causes deformation of the foliage, cupping, and it's going to occur at the tips of branches. So the newest growth is where you're gonna see that injury. Um, and so we don't have a good damage relationship with these guys. We can't give you a threshold for these guys yet. They're not found ubiquitously throughout the southeastern U.S. at this point, but it's something to be aware of. So if you're growing blueberries and you're not in Florida or South Georgia, keep your eyes out for this type of injury and be in close communication with your extension specialists and your extension agents because this is one of those organisms that has the potential to spread to a lot of different locations. All right, so let's move on to the things that we get most of our questions about our fruit feeding insects. And so this is the time of year here in North Carolina where we start seeing fruit feeding critters because we are just edging right up to, to harvest rolling in in a big way. So our two caterpillar pests that feed on fruit and blueberries are cherry fruit worm and cranberry fruit worm. Both of them are going to lay their eggs in the calyx cup of young fruit, so tiny very, green, very tiny green berries immediately after the petal falls off. They feed internally within the fruit and the way in which they feed differs between the two species. I'll show you an image of that on the next slide. They then pupate following feeding on that fruit. Um, so in so the cranberry fruit worm is going to overwinter just at the soil surface as a pupa. And then the cherry fruit worm overwinters either in pruning stubs or in um, dried up leaves near or attached to the plant. So this is the difference in damage between these two species. So cranberry fruit worm feed on more than two berries over the course of their larval lifespan. And so typically what you'll see is this cluster of blueberries with several ripe fruit and what looks like sawdust or cigarette tobacco between them. And that's actually the frass or poop from that cranberry fruit worm larva that has been moving around between those berries and feeding internally within them. Cherry fruit worm feed on two berries during their larval lifespan. And a very common observation in fields that have, have, have cherry fruit worm infestation is one very small, dried up, prematurely ripened blueberry that's attached to a green blueberry next to it that's normal size. If you remove that green berry from the plant, those two berries are often stuck together and you pull them apart and you find the tunnel that the cherry fruit worm larva has made between those two berries. This is the berry where the egg was laid and the, and the larva tunneled in, consumed all of the fruit inside of that and then attached it to its next door neighbor and crawled in to consume this fruit. And so right around now here in North Carolina is when we start seeing a lot of this. Typically what happens is that this insect completes its larval lifespan prior to harvest really getting underway and these prematurely ripened berries are knocked off the plant and not subsequently harvested. The cranberry fruit worm larva is green to kind of a neon yellow, so it also is different in appearance than the cherry fruit worm larva, which is red pink. And so again, in a typical year, it's a potential yield reducer because you're gonna lose some of those berries pre-harvest but not necessarily contamination concern. Where we actually have more problems with cranberry or cherry fruit worm is when we have that late flight and you have caterpillars present at the time of harvest. We monitor for cranberry and cherry fruit worm using pheromone baited traps. And so in these images from my colleague at Michigan State University, you can see cherry fruit worm on the top. You have a male on the left, and then you have a female on the right with a non-target moth below. And you can see these four bands across the back of this cherry fruit worm moth. Um, that's the way to distinguish them from the non-target moths, which have two bands or in some, and are somewhat, somewhat differently shaped um, than the cherry fruit worm. The cherry fruit worm is a bit more open when it has its wings down on the bottom. Cranberry fruit worm moths are about twice as big as cherry fruit worm moths. And they have these distinctive two dots surrounded by a white triangle on their wings when they're captured on a trap. And so you can see a male with its wing opened on the left and a male with its wings closed on the right. 
Um, and so they're going to be larger and they're more distinctive than some of the other non-target models you're going to capture. The pheromone lures that are used in these traps are reasonably species specific and it's a different pheromone for each species. And I generally use two different traps, one for each species. So we recommend the use of these pheromone traps because that tells us when those moths are flying. And that gives us a sense of whether we're talking about an early population that's likely to cycle through before we start harvesting or a later population that might be present at the time of harvest. It also helps us time whatever pesticides we might wanna use for these fruitworm moths. So in locations where you have adult trap captures, you should time your treatments to egg hatch, which is going to be about three days following your peak trap capture. So I'd really encourage you to consider utilizing some of these pheromone baited traps to help determine what the activity on your farm looks like. So generally we recommend selective materials for caterpillar pests to use against fruit worms. These are gonna be things like BT, Intrepid, Confirm, NAC, these are materials that are going to have relatively little non-target impact compared to some of our broad spectrum pesticides. And this is the case unless we have a plum curculio population present. So plum curculio are small weevils which lay their eggs in developing blueberries and then the larvae develop internally. Similar to fruit worms, those fruit prematurely ripen and may fall off the plant prior to harvest, but we run into problems when those fruit are retained on the plant and you have larvae present at the time when you would be picking. Plum curculio is a really tricky nut to crack um, in terms of control. Beetles are often less susceptible to a whole bunch of insecticides and really um, the effective materials we have for plum curculio are tricky to slot into our traditional management program. Um, so there's heavy duty pyrethroid and OP insecticides which could be used. There's a somewhat narrower spectrum material called Avant which the active ingredient is in doxycarb. Um, but the tricky thing about that is we are not allowed to use that material if we're going to export our fruit outside of the U.S., particularly to Canada. So if you are in the situation where you are wholesaling your fruit, understanding the implications for marketing of the pesticides that you're selecting is a really important aspect of your integrated pest management strategy. All right, so let's move on to our next fruit feeding pest, which are blueberry maggots. Um, it's important to distinguish blueberry maggots from our final fruit feeding pest that we'll talk about, which is spotted wing drosophila. Spotted wing drosophila are smaller larvae. Blueberry maggot larvae are about twice as big as spotted wing drosophila larvae when fully mature, although immature blueberry maggot larvae are going to be comparable in size to some of the stages of spotted wing. So size is not your best measurement or your best distinguishing factor, shape is. Blueberry maggot larvae are pointed on one end and blunt on the other end. We often refer to this as being carrot shaped. Spotted wing drosophila are pointed on both ends. Blueberry maggot adults are also about twice as big as spotted wing drosophila adults. This is a male blueberry maggot here. And if you squint, you can see that wing pattern is mimicking a spider. So that's actually a defensive mimicry that that insect has. Um, spotted wing drosophila males have spots on their wings, but otherwise no other wing markings, and they're shaped differently and are smaller than blueberry maggot adults. Blueberry maggot populations can become quite large if left unchecked. Um, you monitor for blueberry maggot adults using yellow sticky traps baited with ammonium bicarbonate lures. And so this is the lure here, and then you have the trap facing downward with the fold. Um, you check these traps at least weekly and then you change the bait on a weekly basis. Basically when it no longer smells like ammonia is when you change the bait. If you don't manage blueberry maggot, they can be incredibly significant. However, if you do manage blueberry maggot, you can essentially eradicate them from, your, from a production area. And this I'm just gonna show you is some work that we did in our North Carolina blueberry production areas. And what I'm essentially showing you here are very few blueberry maggot trap captures. In our main blueberry production area, where our growers aggressively manage blueberry maggot through insecticide applications every roughly 10 days, over the course of an entire year, we caught three blueberry maggot flies total. In our validation location, that organic farm in Western North Carolina, we monitored four traps for a total of eight weeks and we caught 165 blueberry maggot flies. So management can be highly effective for this pest and if you don't manage them, their populations can grow quite large. 
All right, now I'm gonna briefly go through an update on spotted wing drosophila management in the context of blueberries. All right, so I shouldn't need to introduce spotted wing drosophila to folks. We know it's an invasive species in which the males have spots on their wings, the females lack those spots, but have a heavily serrated ovipositor that they use to lay their eggs in ripening and ripe fruit in strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, grapes, and other soft skin crops. They're tricky to manage because they have a rapid life cycle. We can have up to 16 generations per year in North Carolina, and those generations overlap, which means our population builds successively throughout the growing season. They can lay up to 350 eggs per female. Those adults fly long distances potentially, and they eat lots of different things, including a bunch of different non-crop hosts. So over 130 known hosts across 31 plant families, which means that even if we manage them in our commercial fields, there's lots of other places for them to hide and lots of other things for them to eat. Traps can be useful in determining whether or not you have adult flies present, but in most of our production systems, they are not helpful for determining whether or not your population is under control. So traps will tell you whether or not you have flies. They will not tell you whether you have infestation in your fruit. What will tell you whether or not you have an infestation in your fruit is sampling your fruit. And so we developed a sampling program using the salt extraction method, wherein you go out, you collect a sample of fruit, you soak it in salt water and gently crush the fruit. You then let it sit for about an hour, filter it, observe any larvae that have exited the fruit in that time period and count them. And so this is a blueberry sample and what that filter looks like. This is a uh, reusable coffee filter that we use and that it has a fine enough mesh to allow everything other than spotted wing drosophila larvae to pass through. It's not my favorite method for sampling strawberries, but it works really well for sampling blueberries. And this is what you'll see when you run those samples through that reusable coffee filter. So understanding when flies are likely to be active is really important for management. And for blueberries, we typically harvest during a time of year in the southeast when populations might be small but have the potential to rapidly increase depending on local weather conditions. And this is some work that was done with a colleague at Oregon State University. And the take home message I just wanna show you here is that essentially all year long, we have the potential for eggs and larvae to be present, meaning we have risk of fruit damage essentially year round. And they can be coming from fruit that's overwintered, compost piles, coal piles left on farms, fruit that are present over the winter, and then in unmanaged locations, so non-crop habitats. And one of the things that we focused on was trying to understand what conditions favor large numbers of flies to overwinter. This is work that was coordinated by Dara Stockton and Greg Loeb at Cornell University, where we looked at the ability of flies to survive the winter at a number of different locations throughout the country. And we concluded that flies were capable of overwintering all of these locations, but that mortality was increased as temperatures below zero degrees Celsius increase. All right, I am going to very briefly go over this phagostimulant and adjuvant information. The take home information I just wanna give you is that adding sugar or yeast to your pesticide to control spotted wing drosophila is not going to improve efficacy. Regardless of the crop that we looked in, we saw no improvement in efficacy of our insecticides. And we also saw no improvement in control with the use of adjuvants at this point with any of our traditional insecticides for spotted wing drosophila. Um, we have a range of different insecticides that have demonstrated efficacy against spotted wing drosophila. We know that this increased insecticide usage associated with this insect comes with the risk of possible resistance development. The good news that we're seeing so far is that at least in the southeastern US, we have high susceptibility to all the insecticides we're still using. This is not the case everywhere in the country. And so there are, there are some potential concerns about tolerance developing for some active ingredients, particularly in the Western US, but at least for the pesticides that we're currently using, we don't see an increase in tolerance here. And we will keep you guys informed as to whether or not any of our key pesticides are losing their efficacy. The last thing I wanna talk about relative to spotted wind drosophila is post-harvest storage. The take home message is the longer you hold fruit at the coldest temperature possible, 
the more mortality you will have and whatever was in that fruit when it went into the cooler is not going to get any bigger. Very briefly, some emerging pest issues. This is work out of Michigan State University where corresponding with this significant increase in pesticide usage for spotted wing drosophila, they've seen the emergence of blueberry stem gall as a potential management concern. Fortunately for us in the Southeast, this seems to be a heat limited organism. So it seems unlikely that um, at least places, you know, south of where I'm at are going to experience damage. But if you're north of us, paying attention to what might be happening if you're having an increase in insecticide usage is pretty significant. There are a lot of parasitoids present in those galls for that blueberry stem gall wasp. But because we've been using broad spectrum insecticides against spotted wing, we've knocked out some of those beneficials in parts of the country. And then this is the other emerging pest that I always keep talking about here in the southeastern US, and it's just been a challenge to really tease anything out about. But we see um, white flies present, particularly post harvest. These are all live white fly larvae and pupae on the back of a blueberry leaf. And then these are adult white flies. They can be extremely abundant post harvest. We yet have yet to see any real association with damage in with by which I mean yield reduction, um, even in locations where we've seen very high populations of these white flies post harvest. I'm unclear as to what they're doing in our blueberry fields, but we consistently see very high populations of these. And then finally, blueberry mealybugs. So this is something that we see um, again developing in locations where we see large increases in broad spectrum pesticide usage and also in organic blueberry fields, I see blueberry mealybug present. So we're more concerned about them when they migrate to the upper parts of the plant and feed on developing fruit. And it's something we're keeping an eye on to just see how significant they materialize over time. And then scale insects, again, associated with increases in broad spectrum pesticide usage, which we think have knocked out some beneficial insects for these guys. Um, hopefully there's time for one or two questions before I pop off.